coming to you live from DB Audio Studios in Vintuk. This is the Bank Vintuk online agriculture series. We are broadcasting live on the Bank Vintuk Facebook page and YouTube channel. The Bank Vintuk agriculture series allows experts in the field to share their knowledge with those in the agriculture sector and interested parties to contribute to the sector's commitment and drive. This four-part series is set under the theme innovation and trends that will shape the future of agriculture. As a connector of positive change and a responsible corporate citizen, Bank Vintuk believes in driving progress in the communities in which it operates. The agriculture sector contributes about 5% to the GDP annually and is the biggest employer constituting about 24% of the labor force. Therefore, Bank Vintuk believes that it is important to engage and support the sector. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to you all who have tuned in to the second Bank Vintuk online agriculture series. My name is Maria Emanuel, your moderator for this series. Namibia being a semi-arid country with only 2% of land receiving good rainfall to grow crops, there is no doubt that promoting modern agriculture systems brings us closer to meeting the demand for food production. Critical solutions addressed by these modern systems include usage of less water. In this series, we will share with you practical systems to food production, agriculture megatrends, and how partnerships can bring you about the development and sustainability of the agriculture sector. The two-day series will feature the following topics. Succeeding with sustainable irrigation solutions with Isabel van der Stoep. Prospect for establishment of viable aquaponics business in Namibia with Adrian Pierce. Agricultural economic overview looking at the mecha trends. I will be joined in studio by Solomon Bayi. Public-private partnership, unpacking Harambe Prosperity Plan 2, Green Economy, with James Newpe, the economic advisor to the president, and Ruan Best Beer from Ben Vintuk. They will also join me in studio. I encourage you to listen to our speakers and ask questions relevant to the discussion. They will answer your questions during the final segment of each session. To start off this exciting four-part series, our first topic this morning is succeeding with sustainable irrigation solutions. To shed more light on this very interesting topic, I'm joined online by Isabel van der Stoep. Isabel, welcome. Are you there? Good morning, Maria. Isabel. Yes, I'm here. Hello, good morning. Yes, I can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Here? I do. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Ms. Isabel van der Stoep is the general manager at Cherry Irrigation and Approved Irrigation Design. Isabel holds both. <coughs> Introducing Isabel now online with us. Um, she, she holds a bachelor and master's degree in agriculture engineering from the University of Pretoria and is registered as a professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa. She is an approved irrigation design and fellow of the South African Irrigation Institute. She has worked in the irrigation industry for over 23 years and has a great deal of technical field research, training and management experience. The work of Cherry Irrigation has a footprint in South Africa, Namibia and Angola. Isabel, irrigation system is one of the modern technologies within agriculture. Please share more on the background, benefit, as well as the overview and success of irrigation systems in Namibia. Please, I hand over the floor and welcome to the Bank Vintage Agriculture Series. Good morning and thank you very much. I just want to confirm that you are hearing me. Yes, we are very much hearing you loud and clear. Please go okay. ahead. Okay, all right. And that is also sorted out. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to go straight into, into the presentation um, and uh, so that we can start talking about irrigation, which is a passion and uh, also a, a lifelong career for me up to this point and which we as a company is now fortunate to 
be able to also uh, practice in in Namibia. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the basics of irrigation and, and what are the things that a grower investor should be looking at when investing in an irrigation system and uh, what are the considerations to be given attention to. Just a little bit of background um, as to Cherry Irrigation, the company I am representing. Um, we've been in existence since 1987 in South Africa and we expanded to Namibia um, over the last three years. Um, it's been a challenge with, uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic, of course, uh, but we are firmly established there now with our own premises and our own staff in South Africa. We've got a big staff complement of about 60 people. In Namibia, we've got, got four people there and we've got various ISO accreditations that we maintain in order to supply our clients with the best quality service that we, that we can offer. We're also proud members of the South African Irrigation Institute and uh, subscribe to their training and their design norms and standards. Um, in, in terms of our relevance, uh, as I said, we've recently expanded into Namibia and we are established there, but we also work across other parts of, of Southern Africa. So as you can see on the map, I'm not going to go into detail of all of them. And as I said, we've got our premises there in Vintuk and our team that's, that is uh, on the ground there um, and uh, operating. But that's it. enough about, about us and about cherry irrigation. Today we, we had to speak about irrigation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of irrigation, the different environments in which it is taken into consideration, different role players in the sector. And then we're going to talk about the design process to provide our listeners and the people that is watching the presentation with a better overview and insight into what goes into putting that irrigation system on the ground. Um, once the system is on the ground, of course, then it becomes the responsibility of the grower to operate it. And that is what the third section of my presentation is about, the best management practices. How do I operate and utilize my irrigation system uh, optimally. Right, looking at irrigation in context, I'm going to look at it from a different, uh, a couple of different uh, perspectives. The first perspective, of course, is from the perspective of, of the grower. Why do we irrigate? We irrigate because we want to grow a crop. Um, as engineers and technical people, we often fall into the trap of thinking a farmer is an irrigation farmer. But the farmer is not an irrigation farmer, a farmer is a crop farmer. And that should be the focus of their practice on the farm. And as an irrigation company, we are there to support them in, in these endeavors and in, in order to get them to obtain the best yields from the inputs that they give. So when we look at irrigation in the farming context, um, in areas like it was said in the introduction by Maria, that uh, Namibia is indeed a, an arid country. Water is a very important part of, of this uh, farming uh, context. So if we look at our triangle, the, the bottom third of the triangle, just above the, the yellow blocks, um, those are the basic farming practices that any grower or any producer should endeavor to, to put in place. A lot of it is built around healthy soils. Um, so it starts off at the, at the bottom here, just above the yellow. With a, when you start with, with a farming practice where you're going to be irrigating or any farming practice where you're going to grow crops for that matter, is the soil. Um, especially in open field applications, we will touch a little bit on uh, a substrate or growing mediums later on where we don't make use of the in situ soil. But the basis of all farming and especially irrigation farming is the soil. So starting off with a good uh, classification system uh, for the soil and having it mapped so that you know what types of soil occur on the farm uh, is very important because in some cases these soils may not be suitable for irrigation as they are and there might need to be some corrections which is usually done before planting and this could be in the form of chemicals or fertilizers being applied. Then once the chemical side has been corrected there's of course the mechanical side the, the planting action itself in terms of how the, the grower would prepare that field for planting in terms of seedbed preparation and, and, and planting depths especially, because this is influenced by the, the soil that is being uh, used as the basis for that farming practice. 
Thereafter, once the crop is in the field, of course, there's the daily management throughout its growing cycle in terms of insecticides, weed control, um, and at the, by the end of the season, also the planning for the next season that is going to take place in terms of your crop rotation, if you're growing um, uh, uh, rotational crops like field crops, uh, which does not stay in the field permanently. And all of this um, contributes then to having a healthy soil and a soil which we can use for a long period of time. Um, again, in terms of your practices, you could consider minimum or no-tour practices and, and all of that contributes towards having a sustainable soil medium for you to grow the crop in. So these, this bottom third of the, of the triangle really is the basic farming practice that needs to be in place for a grower in order to, to uh, produce crops successfully. Once a grower becomes more experienced, then one can look at the second part of the triangle where you have your higher potential actions that can be taken in order to, to reach a, a higher yield. And this is when we start really managing the crop with a greater intensity. Um, in this uh, part, part here, you can see it could include things like crop specific high potential norms. So this is when you really start to know your crop and what to do exactly what time in the season in terms of um, providing nutrients and in terms of providing water uh, and other interventions in order to get the most yield from that crop that is planted. Um, and that could be, as I said, fertilizer adjustments. And in the case of um, applying uh, irrigation and other substances, the variable rate applications where we actually match what is being applied exactly to what is needed in the field at a specific point. So those are more advanced practices that can, can take place. And that all should contribute to reaching, of course, the, the top of the triangle here, which is the best, best practices per land unit in order to get the best yield. Now, at the bottom of the triangle, you'll see there are three items here, which forms the basis of any uh, practice going forward. And that are the practices related to irrigation management and to water management. So it's very important to grow crops um, under irrigation with effective irrigation shedling approach. And with shedling, we mean when to irrigate and how much water to give, because this will contribute to the oxygen content of the soil and also well as the salinity of the soil. So we can use the water that we apply to manage this oxygen and, this, and the salinity, and this will create a better environment for our roots in order to, to grow optimally. And optimal root development, the, the, the base behind, below that um, is what we are aiming for. It is linked to both our mechanical practices, the tillage, as well as our irrigation practices um, by means of applying the water. And then thirdly, the other uh, aspect to be taken into consideration when we manage water in a field is uh, how we manage the bigger picture, the water distribution, the infiltration onto the, onto the soil and runoff management. So this, these aspects at the bottom here relates directly to the layout of the system, uh, the design of the system, whether the water is being distributed evenly or uniformly across the field, whether it's being applied at the correct rate so that we can uh, have the correct um, application rate that matches the infiltration rate of the soil. And that would prevent runoff during an irrigation event. Because when we apply water, we want the water to enter the soil. We don't want it to run off on the surface and end up in the drainage uh, system um, and then lost to the, to the production. Or even subsurface drainage where we have the water um, draining beyond the reach of the roots through deep percolation. Runoff management could also include things like managing stormwater when we have excessive amounts of water being applied to the soil and how do we protect our field from that. So the basis of irrigation farming is very much the, the water management at a bigger scale in the field as well as on the farm in terms of, of shedling. So I think this is the basis and the starting point of when we start thinking about, I want to go into irrigation farming. So the, the discussion that, that was on the previous slide is very much focused on managing the water at a field level, which is where the focus of the grower or the producer is. 
managing the water at the field level is about managing the water in the root zone. As I said, managing uh, oxygen, making sure that the plant not only has access to the water that it needs, but also to the oxygen, and then very importantly, also to the nutrients. And that is all managed directly at a field level. In terms of our irrigation system, the aspects to be taken into consideration at a field level is the uniformity of the application of the water and the accuracy with which it's being applied. So this is a very important con uh, concept in the irrigation design, and we will refer to it later on again, this uniformity um, on how uniformly or evenly the water is distributed across the field. If we apply fertilizers through our irrigation system in, in the form of, of soluble fertilizers, then uniformity is even more important because now it's not only the water that must be applied uniformly, but also the, the, the nutrients. What you must remember, of course, is that the field is not standing in isolation and the field forms part of the farm. So in order to get the water to the field, there's also requirements for water resource management at a farm level. And at the farm level, it becomes about um, the aspects to be taken in consideration is about a distribution of the water. So usually there would be a water source. It could be a groundwater source like a borer or a well point. It could be a, a dam where runoff water is collected during a rainy periods, or it could be water received from an irrigation scheme like a canal that is fed from a larger supply dam. But some, somehow the water gets to the farm and that water then has to be distributed to the different parts of that farm in order to be applied to the field. So when we look at this, this level of management, it's the important aspects is the energy and the economics of it. In other words, how energy efficiently can I distribute that water from the point where it is available to where I want to apply it in the field? So energy management is very important because normally we have to pump the water. And the moment that there's a pump involved, there's an energy source required. That could be electricity and uh, it could be other things like hydropower, wind power, but mostly we depend on electricity and electricity comes at a rate or at a tariff. And that is where the economics come, comes in. If I properly plan my water distribution at a farm level, then I can distribute that water at the most economical rate to the different parts of the farm. Planning into the future is also a very important part of managing water at a farm level because it might influence my decision on where do I place the water source. Do I place it in the most central part of my farm so that I can distribute it and I can then um, develop in, in different directions around that source. Of course such a location is linked to the soil as we said on the previous slide because the soil is the basis on which we um, form the, the, the irrigation system and we plan and we design it. Right, so the field that we want to manage, we want to irrigate, forms part of the farm and the farm has its own set of requirements in terms of water management and planning. Lastly, and this is not something we're going to talk about a lot today, but that farm forms part of an area uh, where, or a catchment area. It could be an irrigation scheme um, but in general, it will be part of a, of a catchment area where water is available due to the natural runoff and the rainfall patterns that occur. So that is linked to the, the climatic situation and to the, 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 the um, water basin in which that farm uh, occur. So the river basin will determine how much water is available. And it will also, that is the qu quantity of the water, but also a very important aspect that goes with it is the water quality. So water quantity, water availability, and water quality is normally um, managed at a river basin level or a catchment level. Um, and there's not too much that we can do about it once it reaches the farm. But there are interventions that need to be in place. And that is more where our uh, government departments and our water management agencies uh, come into the picture and they manage water at a catchment level. But today we're going to focus more on the field and on the farm. The third context that I want to, to look at is how the irrigation system life cycle uh, looks like. So we see now our farmer wants to get the most from the farming enterprise, of which the soil is, the, is a basic building block. And secondly, there's the water management aspect on the farm. 
But once the water has been supplied, the soil has been checked, there is the, the irrigation system that needs to be put in place in order to distribute that water uh, onto the area that we want to, to irrigate. So if we look at the different uh, phases that an irrigation system goes through in its life cycle, it usually starts with a plan. A, a grower has got an area that they want to irrigate and they have a potential water source. So the planning of the system entails um, investigating the suitability of the soil and the water mostly, and in, of course, in terms of the crop that needs to be produced. Uh, in the background to this, there will be an agricultural economic study that will entail the suitability of the crop for the market that is available and whether it's financially and economically feasible, um, or let's say economically feasible to grow this crop in this specific area. From an irrigation planning perspective, soil, water, crop needs to be taken into consideration in the climatic area that we want to work in. From the planning, there usually follows the design. The design is the engineering aspects of the system that would then be um, selecting and sizing components of the irrigation system. And we will talk in more detail about that in the next um, part of this presentation, the, the detailed steps of the design process. And that design might actually be an input into a feasibility study because one might need to know a little bit more about the costs and the potential of the area. And that will only be known uh, once the design has been done, which can give you then some typical costs of what to expect for the investment required into that irrigation system. Once these questions have been answered, of course, there's also the, the aspect of financing that needs to be in place in order to continue with the installation of that irrigation system. And uh, once all those things have been in, put in place, one can start with the installation. And that is when we start seeing things on the ground, the installation of pump stations, pipelines, and then what we refer to as the infield part of the irrigation system, which is where the actual water is being applied through the emitters on the ground. So the, this first process um, is, uh, is part of the life cycle of the irrigation system that happens once off. Um, and then we have the irrigation system in the hands of the grower. The next step is then for that grower to go through the daily activities around the operation of the irrigation system, which include operation in terms of opening and closing valves, starting and stopping of pumps and planning the, the irrigation events. And a very important other repetitive action, a part of the management is the maintenance that needs to take place on that irrigation system. And then lastly, there's a component of monitoring. And these are repetitive actions that take place on a daily basis. Operation, in other words, starting, stopping the irrigation system. Maintenance, which could include anything from daily maintenance, such as flushing of laterals and pipelines, to bigger scheduled maintenance on pumps and motors. And all of that is overseen through monitoring actions. So monitoring actions um, are things like checking pressures, checking flows, um, using my monitoring equipment like pressure gauges, uh, flow meters, um, even uh, water quality monitoring through EC or pH uh, readings that needs to be taken. Those are the repetitive actions that take place on a daily basis. And this is undertaken by the grower and the operators of the system, the, the laborers on the farm. Monitoring component I want to focus on a little bit because that is the, our warning system, our early warning system. When my monitoring results show, show something that is out of the ordinary, I normally go into a process of evaluating my irrigation system. Now, an evaluation is actually something that should also take place just after installation. So once the system is installed, we do a, a, what we call the commissioning of the system which means we start up the system and we make sure everything is running correctly and we evaluate, we write down on the first day of that system's life cycle that it was operating, what pressures were it running out, what were the flow rates, in other words, what is the baseline for the system's existence on the first day when it was brand new and it was operating uh, optimally. So that first evaluation provides us then with a benchmark with which we can can compare future evaluations with. So um, if we are in the normal cycle of operating, maintaining and monitoring, and we have a, 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 
result from our monitoring events that shows that evaluation is necessary because something is di uh, diverging from our original operational standards. That is when we evaluate the system. And those evaluation results can then result in um, adjustments that need to be made. So the evaluation can pinpoint to us where are things going wrong? Could it possibly be that there was a mistake in the design? Is there something that needs to be adjusted? Is there something that needs to be improved? Because it's, it might be something that wasn't taken into consideration at the beginning of the, of the design process. Or maybe something went wrong during the installation, that some, something was done in a way that is not sustainable and it needs to be improved. It could also point to a problem in operational practices that the system is not being operated as the designer intended it to be. By, for instance, um, not uh, setting pressures correctly at blocks or not uh, or changing something in the pump station that will uh, result in different pressures or flows um, being available to the irrigation system. So operational practices might need to be checked and adjusted. Or it could indicate that there's a maintenance problem, that certain essential maintenance actions are not being undertaken and because of this, um, there are now problems being um, uh, observed through the monitoring that is taking place on a, on a daily basis. So this is the, this is, these are all the components of the life cycle of the irrigation system. And there are different role players also here, um, which brings us to another point in terms of how we work together in order to put an irrigation system on the ground and how we make sure that it gives the best solution to the operator, the client, the owner of the, of the system. So firstly, on the daily operational side, we have our operators, which are normally the responsible pers person responsible for the irrigation at the farm labor level. Um, they need training in order to operate, maintain, and monitor the irrigation system uh, to the, the best uh, possible level. Once problems are experienced at that level, that operator would normally report to a farm manager or on big farming enterprises, there might be a dedicated irrigation manager that is responsible for the water supply and the operation and management of the irrigation systems. So there will be a manager at that level which oversees um, in installation practices or even uh, changes and repairs to existing irrigation systems um, up to the point where certain adjustments have to be made. And all of this is then done in conjunction with the irrigation designer, who is the, the yellow um, oval there, which is responsible for the planning design and installation guidelines for the irrigation system and interpretation of monitoring and evaluation results. So that is more on a technical level and it will only take place at the beginning of the system's life cycle and then throughout it when there are uh, any problems experienced that needs to be addressed from a technical perspective where the inputs of the designer is required. So that presents, this, uh, this slide presents us then with an overview of all the, the actions that we go through in order to put the irrigation system on the ground and then also the actions that the, the owner of the system will have to uh, undertake in order to make sure the system gives it the longest possible service throughout its lifetime. Right, and then from there on putting these things in place, and I've already started uh, touching on the role players in, in the irrigation industry um, by starting to look at the, at the farm level. Um, at the farm level, they, as I said, are the, are the operator of the system and the manager of the system. Um, but the responsible person there is the, is the producer, the end user that have to, to want to grow, grow the crop. And from a sustainable irrigation solution perspective um, and today's presentation also here yeah, on how do we get that irrigation system on the ground is that the irrigation system of course consists of um, components, parts, systems. Um, which is made available to us through our partners on the, on the wholesale side. And these are irrigation companies that import or manufacture the irrigation system components. So this could be pump manufacturers, pipe manufacturers, and the, then the very specialized irrigation companies that supply the irrigation systems themselves. Now to get that irrigation system to the end user, that is where the irrigation designer or the irrigation company comes in. So 
this irrigation company can be seen as a retailer or a dealer. Um, to put it in context, the, how it works, it's the same as, for instance, if you buy a new vehicle, um, the driver of the vehicle do not go straight to the manufacturer and buy it there from the factory. You buy the vehicle through a dealer, through a vehicle dealer, because the dealer is the, uh, the, the agent that also provides the backup service and provides the inputs and the guidance into the selection and then also provide the, the, the after sale service in order to ensure that um, repairs can be made, improvements can be made and problems can be sorted out. So the irrigation industry works exactly in the same way. Um, the irrigation companies provide this link between the suppliers of the equipment and the end users. And the services that they offer forms part of the life cycle of the irrigation system, as well as the irrigation design process, which we are going to focus on specifically. Right, this brings us to the second part of the presentation, where we're going to go into a bit of detail on how does the design of irrigation systems work. What to expect also for a new entrant into the irrigation farming sector on how to go about getting the best possible solution um, on the farm. Right. So the design process normally starts off with an initial consultation and a needs assessment that is done in collaboration between the irrigation designer and the grower, the end user of that, that system. So this is a very important step because here a lot of the uh, footwork is done in order to establish basically the, the rules of the game, the size of the playing field that we're going to have to work in for the rest of the relationship with this um, grower. So basic information questions are asked such as what are the type of crop that needs to be grown, um, under what conditions it's going to be grown, open field or undercover. Uh, we get some basic information in terms of the, the density of planting on the area, plant and row spacings, the growing medium that's going to be used, the water, the irrigation system, and any other uh, peripheral systems like automation and fertigation systems. So I'm going to look at these aspects in a little bit more detail. And this is part of the planning process, so it provides you with the background in terms of the system going forward. So as we said already, um, the soil, the growing medium, forms the basis of our, um, our system. Um, there are good information available about soils in Namibia. Um, there are some high potential soils, as you can see on the diagram on the left, around the central part of the country, and also in the upper parts of the Caprivi there. Um, but in general, there, there is a large part of the country which has low potential soils for uh, crop cultivation. So that is an overall view where one would look at in terms to where do you do your development. Um, the different kinds of soils are pretty well mapped and that information is available. However, two things. Firstly, not having suitable soil is not the end of the process. Um, it is possible to grow crops in other medium, in artificial medium. Um, and that is usually quite an investment, so it is limited to high value crops, but that there is an alternative to using the in-situ soil. However, if one is going to continue with the soil that is available on the farm, then a map as shown on, on the previous screen is not the only solution. Um, that is the way going forward is to actually dig some profile holes and literally to get into the hole or on your knees and start looking at what does the soil look like um, in that area that we want, we want to grow. So basically uh, any soil can be, can be irrigated uh, as long as you have enough money. It's a, a saying that comes from a, a very good mentor of mine in terms of the soils that could pick now. And um, starting off with a better soil also always makes your investment less. So if we start looking at the suitability of soils, there are guidelines available for that on how one can assess the soil that is found on your farm. Um, one of the, the big aspects of course is the, the compilation of the soil in terms of the, the texture, the sand content, the loam content, clay contents. Uh, clay content is a very important uh, factor that we take into consideration. 
A proper soil investigation will take uh, will, will ensure that the area is investigated um, in, in general by means of, of soil profile holes, usually at a grid of about 50 meters apart. Um, and the some of the important information gleaned from that soil investigation would be the clay content, as I said. Um, if you have crops, uh, soils with a very low clay content or a very high clay content, that will uh, put the limitation on the suitability of that soil for different crops and also for, for irrigation. Um, ideally, our irrigable soils sits in an area of clay content between about 15 and maximum 35% clay. Um, so in this area between 10 to 20%, that is a is an ideal clay content for a soil that needs to be irrigated. If the clay content is too high, it holds too much water, it has drainage problems and it is difficult to cultivate. And if the clay content is too low, it presents with other problems in terms of water content storage and the irrigation uh, practices that have to be applied to that. So first aspect is, is clay content. The second very important aspect is the depth of the soil, the depth of the profile. Um, if, the, if the soil is too shallow, it, has, uh, it will prevent problems with cultivation, water storage and also root development. Now there are certain practices that can be implemented to, to, to modify the depth by for instance making ridges um, and those practices can be done but again it uh, takes an investment, some earthworks that needs to be done in order to create basically a depth of soil that is suitable for the crop that you want to, to grow. The, all the information, and I've just touched on two now, clay content and depth of the soil, but all the information that is, is collected from a soil survey is then usually comp, uh, compiled into an irrigation potential map, and that will then be classified from irrigation class one to five, where irrigation classes one and two are normally the most suitable for uh, uh, irrigation, or is the, is the most suitable for irrigation. From a class three onwards, it will require, for instance, investment in soil, um, in, in earthworks, investment in chemical correction, um, investment in, in structural correction of the soil, and those investments cost um, uh, money, and therefore it makes the development more expensive, so not, although not impossible. Right, so soil is also uh, the, an important aspect for our irrigation system. In the case of center pivots, for instance, the type of soil and the, the texture of the soil in terms of the clay content, sand content, silt content, which determines our uh, soil class, um, will also determine the type of droplet size or the, 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 uh, the size of the droplets, which are most suitable for that uh, specific soil. And that will then again have an influence on the type of sprinklers that we choose if we're uh, uh, applying water with an overhead system, such as a center pivot. So it's not only important for our crop development, but it's also important for our irrigation system design and selection of the right components. Right, once the, the soil has been uh, sorted out, the next aspect that we take a look at in more detail is the water quality. This is now all during the planning of the irrigation system. Um, water isn't pure, it has impurities in it, and there are basically three main groups of impurities. There are uh, organic impurities, bacteria, viruses, algae, things that grow uh, in the water. Then there are physical impurities, which are your suspended solids. These are physical uh, content in the water that I can see with my eye, sand particles, silt particles, algae, um, broken down and uh, drifting in the water. And then the third type of impurities are chemical impurities. And these are normally not visible with the eye. Things like the iron content, manganese content, um, calcium, uh, sodium, uh, those are all the chemical contents of the, of the water. And that will have a direct effect on how we can use and apply the water. So the water quality has an effect on three aspects. Firstly, it can have an effect on the plants, which is of course a very important aspect for the grower to take into consideration. Um, nutrient burn can occur by things like the high sulfur content, high sodium content, um, high ammonium content in the, in the water, and it can have a direct effect on the quality on your, on your, on your crop. So it's important for the grower to know 
the, the requirements and the limitations from a crop perspective. Secondly, the water quality will have an effect on the soil. It could have an effect on the infiltration potential of the soil by causing a dispersion, high sodium contents can cause that, or it can have a sal salinization effect on the soil, again with, with sodium. So that can have an effect on the soil and it might need treatment before being applied, or it might have an effect on how you prepare your soil and what type of irrigation system you choose with which to apply the water. And thirdly, the water quality also has an effect on the irrigation equipment. And this is mostly in terms of causing blockages um, in the system. The top two pictures here, you can see the brand new dripper system applying water and giving a high flow rate. And over time, these drippers blocked up and the drippers were giving less water and thereby the, the application from the system reduced. Or individual emitters could start blocking up um, from the water quality that is being used. Um, yeah, various uh, influences on, on the equipment. I'm not going to go through all of them, but mostly we distinguish between two types of effects. It's either the water is aggressive, therefore it has a corrosive effect on the irrigation equipment, or it has a depositing effect, and that means it causes scales and blockages in the irrigation equipment. So there are various um, uh, analysis that can be done to give us early warning of the contents of the water that could potentially cause these problems in the irrigation system. So if the water needs to be used because it might be the only water available um, and that is the source that, that, that needs to be applied, there are of course, of course treatment options. So bearing in mind the three types of impurities that we have, chemical, physical, and uh, biological or organic. There are different water quality treatment processes that can be used to remove these uh, impurities. For physical um, removal of big particles, the things that we said is visible by, by, with your eye, um, mostly we do filtration. Um, Macrofiltration is removing particles uh, that is, is very vis visible, with big particles, using a filter medium. If the particles are, uh, are very small, um, then we normally have to start looking at ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration is where we use um, membranes normally, and rather than a filter medium, a physical filter. And these then can go up to different um, uh, degrees of, of filtration, even up to nanofiltration. And if we have chemical uh, if we want to remove chemicals from the water, we can use reverse osmosis. Although you can see in terms of the costing of it, the, pr the process has become increasingly more expensive and therefore less attractive um, to, the, to the agricultural water user. Um, basic processes like sedimentation, where we have the water standing in a dam and there some of the physical impurities can then settle in that settling pond or settling dam is sometimes a more affordable uh, solution, but it may need to be combined with other processes uh, such as coagulation or flocc flocculation in order to get the suspended material to sink down to the bottom of a settling dam um, or to be removed through filtration. Then again, once it's become bigger particles that can actually be filtered out physically with a filtration medium. This is quite a specialized field and there are specialists that work on it and we partner with different companies to provide us with the best solution for a specific water sample that is presented to us in, in uh, difficult situations. More commonly found uh, in irrigation systems is, is different uh, uh, physical filters, um, filtration that takes place. Um, the, the terminologies and the definitions presented in the previous two slides can be quite intimidating and confusing. So in agriculture, we can often just uh, define our water that is available by, by simple terms. Um, when would we have a good water? A good water quality would be a water that is drawn maybe from a borehole, which is fairly a clear water, it looks clear, uh, or it could be from a steadily flowing river, which is, is clear water, um, properly maintained borehole, and it's got no chemical problems in terms of especially iron and manganese or from any solids. That is what we would define as a good water quality. It's, it's, um, it's clear and it's got no serious chemical uh, imbalances. Average water quality 
uh, river streams, the canals, which are flowing a bit slower, and therefore you would have more um, more settlement around it um, in, in cold climates, uh, but not a lot of biological growth because of that colder climate or a reservoir in a cold climate um, with good planning for the suction of the water from that source. Um, and uh, the, the, those are some of the physical um, aspects one can put in place in order to, to uh, uh, prepare the water before it enters the actual filtration system. Three typical types of filtration that we, that we use is um, older uh, methodology is your sand or your media filters, where the water is, uh, flows through the sand bed under gravity and is collected before it enters the irrigation system. The sand is then back flushed from time to time to remove the impurities that is caught in that sand and the sand needs to be replaced. Um, got high maintenance requirement and also the back flush water that is exiting this system um, actually has quite a, a lot of water. Second type of, of, of filtration is your screen filters. A screen filter is like a sieve. It offers a one a dimensional uh, degree of filtration. In other words, um, once the water has gone through the sieve, that was the only opportunity for the water to have been filtered or any impurities to have been captured. If that sieve inside here is damaged, then the filter fails and the dirt will go through to the irrigation system. Um, but it's good for, for, for uh, microfiltration and removing bigger particles in systems which are not as sensitive um, to blockages, and that would be systems like sprinkler irrigation or center pivot irrigation. And lastly, we've got our disk filtration systems, which is the, the best technology used on, on farm level because it, it offers multi-dimensional uh, filtration. So it's not only one degree of filtration inside the disk uh, holders here. There are many disks forced together where the water is pushed through. And um, if this filter fails, it normally fails in the closed position, which means that it will block up completely rather than let dirty water through into the irrigation system. So um, they have their application. Sand filters are particularly good if you have got high bacterial uh, um, organic loads in your water. And uh, that's mostly where they are used nowadays, um, having been replaced with a more modern technology um, that also uh, causes less backwash water and allows for irrigation to continue um, even when the filters are being backwashed. For worse water qualities, poor water would be defined at, as uh, water in hot climates where we've got a lot of growth and chemical, um, uh, sorry, uh, high biological growth and which where the, 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 in, uh, the inflow into the dam is, into the irrigation system from a settling dam has not been planned properly. Um, and then your very poor water would be water which is, which is not clear at all. Um, it's got a high sediment load, maybe after flood specifically, or it's a reservoir which has got very poor suction conditions where the suction uh, inlet into the pump is positioned at the bottom of the reservoir so that it will suck in a lot of dirt that is suspended in the water. And then any chemical problems, especially dissolved iron and manganese, which can cause blockages um, when, it uh, when it oxidation takes place in the irrigation emitters. So for situation like this, we would use things like um, uh, these rotating screens um, from a canal offtake, for instance, to remove algae um, and water grass and big particles. And from there, it could even have to go into a settling dam where the water will move slowly through these zigzag patterns before it gets stored into the farmer's reservoir. And in this settling uh, path here, a lot of the big um, physical impurities will have time to drain or to settle at the bottom and it can be removed um, from time to time. Right, so once the water and the soil has been sorted out, we also have to make a decision regarding the irrigation system. Um, the oldest type of irrigation system is, of course, our flood irrigation. Uh, we're not going to talk about that a lot today, but that are things like your furrow irrigation, your border irrigation, and even things like basin irrigation, where we flood big parts of the, of the field at, at a time at uh, long intervals. Um, the first type of really mechanical ir irrigation that was developed uh, was in the 1920s is your sprinkler irrigation and it's still around today. Sprinkler irrigation simulates rain by distributing water on the surface by means of a set of nozzles that is spaced out across the field. 
We've got different configurations. Your per permanent sprinkler systems are normally suitable only for permanent crops like pastures. Um, and uh, the portable systems offer other advantages in terms of moving the water across the field um, or moving the irrigation system across the field to allow for um, uh, uh, cultivating of the soil in between uh, seasons or to save on costs because now you don't have to put all the, the pipes in place um, to irrigate the, the, the whole area at once. The next development was in the 1950s when they um, mobilized sprinkler irrigation in terms of your center pivots and shortly thereafter your linear move systems. So a center pivot is essentially a set of overhead sprinklers mounted on wheels and fixed to the middle of the area from where the water is distributed from the inside out. Um, a linear move system is a center pivot that moves in a straight line. In other words, the center uh, or the supply point is not fixed, but it actually moves with the rest of the machine. Um, it does have advantages, but it can also be difficult to manage if your land is not uh, perfectly uh, flat or relatively flat. And of course, there's always the issue of supplying the water, which is now not a fixed point anymore, but a moving point. So they either have to be a canal or they have to be a pipe that is dragged behind the machine in order to supply the water. Traveling guns can also be used. And then the final grouping here is your micro irrigation group, where we apply water to partial parts of the field. In other words, we've got strip wetting point application through either a dripper system or through your micro sprinklers. And these, are, these systems are more suited to permanent crops like orchards, um, vineyards, uh, where we um, uh, install and the irrigation system when the crop is planted and it stays in place for a long period of time. So your irrigation designer can guide you in terms of the best selection to be made on the type of irrigation system to be used for a specific crop. Another input that has to be decided on is the fertigation system. Um, of course, fertilizer can be applied by hand uh, on the soil, but in that case, it would need an overhead system such as a center pivot or a sprinkler system where the fertilizer can be washed into the soil. Um, if we start looking at our permanent irrigation systems, especially our micro irrigation systems and our drip irrigation systems, we cannot wash granular fertilizer into the soil using a drip system and then we make use of fertilizer injection systems. And this can be a simple single channel dosing system where we make use of a dosing pump that um, takes the fertilizer from the mixing tank and it is injected into, into the system, into the main flow of the water going uh, to the irrigation system. So the, the clean water then being enriched through the dosing pump and pumping that to the system. If we have more uh, complicated requirements from crops like blueberries, where you've got certain EC and pH requirements that have to be met continuously, we may need fully automated multi-channel injection systems that apply the, the fertilizer in the irrigation water. Further uh, part of the planning of the irrigation system is the automation system and the control systems. So automation refers to how do I automate the, the operation of the system. Typical system might entail a, a base station um, where the uh, uh, instruction is sent via, uh, it could be a radio frequency or a GSM uh, system where the um, message is sent to a receiver in the field that will open a valve or close a valve that controls the irrigation uh, to, to that uh, specific area. These type of systems can be expanded to also control and monitor other sensors and inputs, but mostly then we make use of cell phone networks to convey that sort of information. And there are other uh, uh, networks or platforms that can also be used um, LoRaWAN and so on to on a smaller area uh, where you need to send a signal to a receiver in the field. Control systems also uh, entail pump control. Uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, pump optimization at the end of the presentation where I will touch on this. This would be switching pumps in the pump station on and off and making sure that the load is evenly distributed so that you get an even wear on the pumps that is available for the for the system. Um, 
in some cases the equipment might be uh, uh, quite sensitive and you may need to control the climate uh, by means of air, air conditioning to make sure all the electronics are running um, at the right temperature. Um, variable speed drives is, is such a, a component which offers certain advantages um, for us to, to control and to optimize our pumps, um, but it does require some, some better uh, management. Um, simple robust systems can often also do the job, so it's really about finding the best solution for the specific situation at hand. Right, so that's the planning part of the design process. Once the system has been planned, um, in order to prepare for the design, we need to have a accurate layout of the area on which the irrigation is to be developed. And this would entail a topographical survey. Um, mostly we use real-time kinematic GPS equipment where someone has to go out and walk the area to be surveyed and collect the elevation and the, and the coordinates of uh, different points in the field. And these points are then used to create a contour map on which the infrastructure can be planned and laid out. Even things like uh, soil uh, pits where we do the soil investigation, the water source, any infrastructure like roads and power lines that needs to be avoided. Um, and that is essential to the next step of the irrigation uh, design, which is the, um, sorry, the step after the stakeholder involvement, which is the design of the system. Part of this, once the map has been created, often this is used as a basis for consultation with the client, as well as other parties, such as agronomists, um, uh, consultants, soil science, uh, scientists, or um, greenhouse manufacturers, where systems have to be laid out. So it's a very important basis for the further planning of the system. Um, which then will start off with checking based on the information co collected during the initial consultation, whether there is enough water and energy available for the, the, the planning. Um, uh, water is, is, uh, is linked to a legal requirement often, also natural occurrences, and energy can be linked to applying for a bigger electricity point from the grid supplier or planning maybe for a solar investment um, for electricity supply to the area. So based on the information collected, the first step would be to determine the irrigation requirements of the new development on that area, and that is based on climatic requirements, and then from that to assess whether there's adequate water available from the source that has been identified or sources, and then uh, thirdly to do the, the energy planning in terms of how much electricity is going to be needed to operate the system. And this is good to do this upfront so that the client also knows to make uh, provision for additional energy or additional water or to, to change the, the layout or the scale of the, of the development. Right, from here on, once we've got the go-ahead on that, it is then time to actual, do the actual design of the system where our designers come in. So this is then, as I said earlier, the selection and the sizing of the different components of the irrigation system, um, from the water storage right to, to where the water and the fertilizer is being applied to the soil. And it could also include additional aspects such as handling the drainage water or collecting roof water from uh, plastic uh, tunnels or structures and reusing that or at least conveying it away from the site in a safe way not to cause damage to the to the system. So for the design of the system we uh, use firstly of course there's product knowledge that is necessary but then there's different software packages that we use to size the pipes and also then to prepare the necessary drawings and documents that is presented to the client. So um, the design then what the client will see is a layout normally uh, that shows the development um, in terms of pipes and positions of water storage and how the water will be conveyed from that central position to the different areas um, together with instructions on what your system is going to look like uh, in terms of the components, the valves, the pipes and the fittings that are going to be used to install that system. Part of that design is also uh, the, the head control. This could be a sophisticated, uh, fully automated system with fertigation, such as the one shown here, with your fertilizer uh, storage on, on this side, entering the irrigation system via a uh, automated dosing system, um, water being pumped um, to the irrigation system here, 
uh, going out through the valves and um, also being filtered, the filter in the background there. Um, these systems are carefully planned and discussed with the client in order to make sure that what is on paper serves the purpose of the current and any possible future expansions um, of that farming enterprise. Um, it could also be more simpler layouts, also having the same sort of components built into a container, which is very useful. We can be built at our premises and shipped as a complete unit, only to be connected and commissioned on site. And in that way, um, making sure that everything is done um, in an in, uh, in easy in installation environment um, where uh, the, there's control over the, the installation process. But again, this planning is done carefully to make sure that the, the best possible solution is found. Right, so this is where the client starts seeing something for, for the, the development uh, that's being invested in, in terms of the plans. And of course, the, the documents, the drawings, the list of items that is, is, uh, is going to be needed as compiled in what we call a bill of quantities or a bill of materials. And that bill of materials is then literally what is used to, what is going to be used to order the material, but also very importantly, what is going to be used to price the system. So um, if we look at uh, the, the process from where a irrigation designer is initially consulted to, um, to, to provide a solution to the client, to what the client is asking for at that point, which is the quotation. You can see there are a lot of steps that have to go, we have to go through in order to present the client with the best possible solution. And it's important for a um, grower to understand that if you request a quotation, it's not possible to present that the next day because the very next day there are a lot of information that is still outstanding. And if to pre prepare a proper design for the specific conditions, it is necessary to go through these steps and just take a little bit of time um, in order to, to think of everything that needs to be taken into consideration. Second point I want to point out here is that also then because of the different situations, as I've explained in terms of anything from the type of system, the topography, the, the location of the water, the energy source, the, the, the um, additional aspects such as automation and fertigation, it's very difficult to give a thumbs up price per hectare for a specific system. Uh, and it's even dangerous to do that because people do their planning on the basis of that and then they come up short at the end if there's something that was not taken into consideration. So I think those are things for a, a, a client to keep in mind when they are working with the, uh, with the irrigation designer. Right, from here on, once the project is approved and the financing has been arranged, it's of course time to supply the material, uh, all the components on the bill of material. There's uh, some transport involved, a lot of logistics around sourcing uh, the correct and the best priced material for the client and making sure that it arrives at the right time, at the right place, um, so that it can be installed. So the installation process normally entails um, a process of uh, installing uh, pipelines, installing different fittings, um, preparation from the design from the irrigation company could be preparing fittings uh, um, off-site and then sending it there. Um, On-site, of course, there will be some aspects such as trenching and uh, unrolling pipes that have to take place there as part of the process. Infield installation is often done by our clients themselves. We can provide them with training um, in order to punch holes, fit drippers and position emitters uh, in a growing medium, such as this example on the left, or in the case of open field um, installations, such as these micro sprayers, uh, that, that is a quite a repetitive action and can normally be done more cost effectively by the client themselves on the farm. Um, setting up center pivots, um, things like that is normally done by contractors who's got the right equipment for the, for the specific types of systems. Main lines can be dedicated main lines, such as the example shown here, where we use HDPE pipe. Um, this is when the fertil fertigation takes place in the pump house. We have to send the correct fertilizer and water mix to each block with a dedicated main line. Um, and uh, we use uh, this HDPE pipe for it, which is welded together using um, a welding machine or electrofusion fittings, depending on the application and the point where it is being used. 
um, normal PVC uh, um, combined main lines is also can also be used. Um, it's of course got a, a lot more, a lot, lot larger number of joints, which make opportunity for leaks um, much more likely. In the pump house itself, there's the head control installation. Uh, normally the pumps are placed as well as the dosing machines and the filters and then the pipe work is connected in between there and the electrical cables is connected to the different components. Um, so there's a hydraulic component as well as electrical component that have to be installed. Installations uh, on the water supply side uh, could also doesn't have to be as fancy as the previous slide. It could be more basic installations where water is taken from a river with a portable uh, pump, um, and uh, but the installation process needs to be planned with the same degree of care um, in order to make sure all the fittings is on site and everything can be done correctly. Once everything is in place, uh, we do what we call commissioning, which is then basically launching the system, uh, setting up dosing machines, making sure drives are set up correctly, making sure pumps are running correctly, and uh, doing a simple evaluation in, in order to ensure that the system is running as the designer in, um, ex, uh, planned it to, to run as per the design specifications. And that uh, concludes the, the operation, uh, the design side of things. Um, since the system is installed and on, in place on the farm, then it's actually when the operation starts and when the grower becomes responsible for the day-to-day -day operation. Now, I'm not going to go through every single operational aspect of an irrigation system. There are standard um, operational practices, starting and stopping of pumps, opening and closing of valves, um, that we provide training in, uh, at, or the irrigation design company should provide training to the, to the client when the system is commissioned. But what I want to point out today is a, is a few of the new, newer trends and tools that are being used by the growers um, in, in the agricultural irrigation industry. Um, the first one is not new, but it's such an important aspect, um, and that is on irrigation shedling. And the second one, I want to touch a little bit on remote sensing, and then I'm going to wrap up on energy management and what we should know about pumps and managing in the best possible way to save on our operational costs. Firstly, on irrigation shedling. So once you have an irrigation system, um, the day-to-day -day operation is essentially shedling the irrigation. What do we mean by shedling? Shedling is a decision-making activity that in, uh, needs to answer two questions. When must I irrigate next? And when I irrigate, how much water should I give? So when to irrigate, how much to irrigate? You can um, compare it to the way that you manage your vehicle's fuel tank. When am I going to next put in diesel and how much am I going to, to, to put in? So people follow different strategies, as with a diesel tank. Some people fill up every week, some people fill up every day, some people fill up when the tank is half, some people drive until the light comes on, um, showing the tank is empty, and when they put pet, uh, diesel in, it could be fill it up to the top, put in 500 rand or fill it up half. So there's different strategies, and it's the same with managing our water. The, the basis of shedling should be made on a prediction. So in order to decide when to irrigate and how much to irrigate, you should have an idea of when this should take place. And normally there are models, shedling models that are used to predict water use, and that could also be done over a season. So there's a prediction in terms of when I should next irrigate. Then normally I check it, I measure it with a tool. There are different tools that we'll briefly talk about just now. And then once I've got the feedback, I do an assessment. Is my prediction and the action that I've taken, is it having the necessary effect on the plant or the soil or whatever aspect of the crop that I am monitoring or of the growing system, I should say. So that is basically what happens during irrigation shedding. So I'm going through this repetitive action on a daily basis. So in terms of the tools, there are many devices available and they vary in approach and complexity, but they all measure something. That is the, the basis of it. It could be a climate-based measurement. Um, 
the, the oldest type of, of uh, measurement in the recent 30, 40 years of irrigation management is the evaporation pan, which literally measures how much water evaporates on a daily basis. Nowadays, more um, modern methods use uh, weather stations, which measures various uh, aspects of the climate. And then there are mathematical models that calculate evaporation or what we call evapotranspiration of a plant. And that is then used as the basis for, for irrigation planning and scheduling. Otherwise, there are soil or plant-based measurements that can be done, uh, mostly soil measurements, tensiometers is available, neutron probe was a technology that was widely used in the 90s. There are heat dissipation sensors, time domain reflectometers, and what is most commonly used uh, for measuring in the soil is our capacitance probes. So capacitance probes measures water content in the soil through electrical capacitance, and that is then related to the water content in the in the soil. Um, this is the most common type of measurements used still. Um, there are other methodologies as well, different types of probes. They come usually in different lengths, depending on how deep your, deep your rooting depth is. And that is then taking measurements at different depths in the soil, which then presents us with the activity of water at different depths in the root zone of the crop. And these are then usually presented as graphs. So the big advantage of using a, a system like this compared to some of the other systems shown here, which the, the, the old grandfather was the neutron probe, where you had to go out once a week and take your readings and then process it, um, is continuous measurement. So continuous measurement uh, is better than point data because if you go out and you take measurements once a week of your soil water content, you present it with a number of readings over a period of time, but you don't know actually what is happening in between. So if you have an upper limit and a lower limit for water content in the soil, you might actually think that you're doing fine and you're managing your root zone well, but you do not know what is happening in between. With capacitance probes and other types of monitoring sensors that logs continuously, you actually get a continuous picture of what is happening in the soil. And in this case, we can see they are wetting the soil extremely and then allowing it to dry out beyond the lower limit that has been set. Then flooding it again, leaching some of the nutrients out and then allowing it to dry out. So this crop is being subjected to extreme wet and dry conditions on a continuous basis, and this is not optimal for our um, production and yield. Right, so uh, most of the systems therefore present the, 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 the results as, as data uh, in a continuous graph. Um, and this is achieved by installing it. It's important to install it correctly. Installation of such a, a, a probe mostly would entail preparing a, a hole where, in which the, the probe must be fitted in a way that there's no air around it. Um, the integrity of the site is important and not to trample the crop around there and also to place it correctly relative to the plant and to the emitter. Thereafter, there's data collection that can take place at, with a remote connection and download it uh, to a laptop, or it can be completely uh, remotely collected um, via remote stations, which has a transmitter and sends that information. And that information then can be presented as graphs and often viewed on our cell phones or computer platforms um, as things are the norm nowadays. Um, here's a number of examples just to show some of the typical data that one would get. Uh, you literally see day and night movement of water in the soil. That would be at night when there's not a lot of water used by the plant or not any. And that would be in the day that the soil is, is drying out. So you can see cooler days, um, warmer days where there's more uh, water evapotranspiration. And then when the water in the soil starts to dry out, how the plant is limited in terms of its abstraction. Um, there's a day where there was water use of eight millimeters by that crop on this specific example. Different readings at different levels will also show to us whether um, the, the water is being used at different levels. Um, and as the sensors sit at different depths in the soil, and it will also show to us if our irrigation is effective and up to what depth. 
We can also supplement this, these monitoring uh, or scheduling tools with other monitoring tools, such as soil moisture probes, and even in the case of our um, uh, medium planting, we can physically weigh the pots or the bags and in that way determine how much water is being applied. While a flow meter is of course always the, the good basis of measuring water use. This sort of uh, on the ground uh, monitoring can be um, supplemented with remote sensing methods where um, Data is collected on the electromagnetic spectrum and interpreted to give us information on things like biomass production, production, leaf area index, and also important for the irrigation farmer evapotranspiration and water use. Um, this is just some examples of the info type of information that would be obtained from these ki kind of uh, monitorings uh, via satellite. Um, in terms of biomass, in terms of evapotranspiration, and that could then be used to calculate things like water use efficiency. Um, chemical aspects can also be monitored to some extent in terms of nitrogen content, and this information can also be collected via aircraft in form of drones or, lo or low-flying um, aeroplanes fitted with cameras. In this case, you would get things like individual tree information that can be used to identify potential problems or water use um, requirements. Plant health or uh, even surveys can be done using these remote sensing technologies. Even on your pivot, you could get information uh, where you could see there are rings here, which shows that there are inadequate sprinkler overlap under this specific pivot that has been designed. Lastly, I want to touch on the point of energy management. If we look at the pump station, where about 80% of the life cycle cost of the irrigation system goes, it's very important to operate, to select and operate pumps as good as possible. Uh, any pump has got an operational curve and it's important to select that pump to run as close as possible to the high efficiency or the best efficiency point of that curve. And this your irrigation designer will do for you. Furthermore, the installation conditions must be correct. And this is in terms of approach conditions to the pump specifically that will influence the NPSH requirements. And lastly, the operation of that um, pump in terms of the kilowatts that it will draw must be such that it is operated in the best possible tariff plans and at the least uh, expensive periods if you are using a time of use tariff plan. In terms of the design, um, we try to use variable speed drives rather than throttle systems. We try to use multiple pumps um, to cover wide load variation rather than a single pump which is throttle, throttled. And we also make sure that we monitor our pumps as well as possible um, using pressure gauges, flow meters, volt, uh, voltage displays, ammeters, um, and everything else um, like the pump control uh, systems that I also showed earlier. For the farmer, general guidelines in order to improve efficiency and save on electricity cost is replacing old and inefficient pumps and motors with more energy efficient uh, systems, which will um, save literally on the kilowatt requirements of that pump station. Um, other opportunities lies in solar installation, whether that is possible and whether it is a, a, a cost effective solution. And then to do general monitoring of the pump station in terms of the running and the heat and noise in the pump station to ensure that the pumps run optimally and losses are minimized. So in conclusion, our guidelines for developing sustainable irrigation solutions is have your irrigation system planned and designed for your specific circumstances by a knowledgeable professional. Always consider future developments when you're planning a system, make space in the pump house, um, oversize the, the pipelines if necessary, if you know that there's going to be an expansion. And at that point of purchasing the system, invest in the best technology that you can afford. Finally, not only is the hardware important, but the management system is as important and it needs to be planned as well as the hardware in order to obtain an optimized water and energy utilization from your system. I thank you for the opportunity and uh, we look forward to answering some questions.
Thank you, Isabel. Uh, what an insightful and a very technical presentation indeed. Um, we have come to the end of our presentation, and now we would like to invite, uh, of course, questions. We, we got some questions um, on our Facebook as well as on our um, you know, YouTube that I would like to just engage with you, Isabel. Um, I think for, for the first one, just a quick one, uh, interesting enough, if one has the right water, the right soil, and this is really looking at uh, perhaps small scale farmers on a one piece of, um, let's say, hectare land, um, what would probably be a, a, a good budget for, for an irrigation system if you may be looking at, uh, let's say, tomato production? Okay, uh, Maria, yeah, as, I, as I pointed out earlier, it's, it's difficult to give a, a, a ballpark figure because uh, the situations vary. Um, and uh, is that water coming out of a borehole? Is it in a dam? Is it, does it have it to go into a tank? Does it have to be filtered? So it's, it's really very difficult to, to, to put just a, a figure down for, uh, for that. We do have um, modular systems. And, and I think that will probably be the best solution for a situation like that, is, is to provide a modular system of, say, for instance, 3,000 square meters, which is 0.3 of a hectare. And a farmer can then expand from that. And you will know the costs up front, and you will know what to expect. So, so those, those solutions will be best suited to the small-scale farmers. Um, that we have, uh, and also what our experience has been in both Namibia and Angola. And, and I think the, the, the second question is, it really has to do with uh, training mentorship because it's very, very technical and throughout your presentation, uh, each point you, you, you have to have, you know, somebody who's very skilled um, to sort of manage, especially through operation and, and management. Are you offering any educational programs or mentorship sessions to people who, who wants to get into this um, sort of ir irrigation technological um, you know, set up? Uh, currently, we offer um, training to, to our clients. So when we supply a system, uh, we would provide the necessary training for that. Um, but it is possible to arrange that sort of training. Um, in South Africa, we work very closely with the South African Irrigation Institute, um, who are, uh, is the organization that arranges training interventions. Um, but there's no, nothing stopping us from arranging similar interventions uh, in, in Namibia. Um, obviously, if you can get a group of people together, um, it makes it more, more valuable for, for them because then one can share experiences and, and handle the questions as they arise for the different situations. So, yeah, definitely would, one would be able to arrange something like that. Awesome. And um, I saw there were some really sort of you know, technology, very much advanced technology, monitoring the soil and drawing graphs directly. Um, are there, has there any been any uh, development of, let's say, usage of apps where farmers could, uh, you know, innovative sort of, you know, in that space to, to monitor the operation of, of the system on, on the farm? Has there been any rise to any, you know, interesting technology through app development? Yeah, definitely, um, and, and especially now in, 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 uh, as we've uh, lived through the COVID pandemic over the last um, 18 months, um, last year it, it, it showed us definitely remote management is essential, and we've seen a lot of development uh, over the last uh, couple of months um, with apps. Um, a lot of it is satellite-based uh, monitoring to, to monitor your whole farm but also then specific monitoring points um, on the farm using the equipment that you've put down. So yeah, most definitely there's been a lot of development in that, in that field and agriculture is not standing back for technological advances um, in, the, in, in this arena. No, awesome, and, and perhaps just to, to, to everybody who wants to sort of get into this career, um, what process do one needs to follow to start a career as improved irrigation um, design or a technician? Okay, that's a, that's a very nice question. Um, uh, the, um, if you want to become an irrigation designer, a good basis for it is a background in engineering. So um, 
you, the, it's something called agricultural engineering, but it's only it's only offered at a limited number of, of universities. So, um, a, a degree in or a diploma in, in uh, mechanical engineering usually forms a very good basis for uh, going into irrigation design because it teaches you the principles of hydraulics and pumps and everything. Um, so yeah, so so starting off uh, or going into an engineering direction is is very good. Of course, uh, your agri uh, agronomic sciences also can provide you with an entry point, um, but the mechanical engineering entry point is is a very useful one. Awesome, and and really looking at this is the final question. Looking at Namibia, we 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 started off with the you know, the environmental condition of, of the country. You showed us, you know, especially the interesting maps on, 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 on that is already available to see the information. Um, it comes back again to probably the communal farmers. What would your recommendation specifically to Namibia now that we, when we talk about food security, household level, and also really, you know, shifting away from the traditional rain-fed you know, type of, um, you know, systems that because of the climate change. Any final words maybe, you know, that you could give to, to farmers, specifically communal farmers, that, that in terms of irrigation that, that they could look at, specifically in Namibia? I think, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's good to know, it's, one shouldn't be scared to start small, because when you start small, you learn um, and you, you grow with your irrigation system. So I think... Um, having a, a simple system that works well, uh, that give, doesn't give you a lot of problems, is a good place to start. And then you can grow from there. Um, it's, it's essential to, to learn irrigation over a period of time. The irrigation farming has got a lot of um, challenges. Um, and to start small and make small mistakes is a lot less costly than to start big and to make big, big mistakes. So having a good partner to, to walk the road with you, to ha have the, the right information in terms of crop selection, in terms of uh, nutrients uh, management, in terms of, of soil and water management, I think, think that's important. So strengthening those uh, institutional systems also to pro provide that support and working with the industry to, to, to the, the get out and get on, on the ground. I think that is, that is essential. But I think my, my main message would be start small, learn it, and then grow. And, and then really the sky is the limit. Thank you so much, Isabel. This has really been interesting. I did agriculture economics, and I wish I would have, you know, branched into engineering because it's, it's very interesting when it comes to the technical uh, setup. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the first session of the Bank Vintuk Online Agriculture Series. Once again, I want to thank Isabel for joining us, as well as our audience for participating in this very informative event. As mentioned to you earlier, this is a four-part series, and we will continue this afternoon at 2.30, just right after your lunch, with a discussion on prospects of the establishment of viable aquaponics business in Namibia with Adrian Pierce. From me, Marie Emanuel, have a productive day ahead, and I look forward to your company this afternoon. Thank you very much.